panelists that have joined us. Um, we've got Professor Paul Koshanian, Stuart, and hopefully yeah. we've got Charles joining us, and that's worked perfectly, yeah. Charles. Thank you for rejoining. Um, I don't know if you've managed to pick up uh, with Dan Sadler's uh, presentation a moment ago, but we've just uh, left him in the lurches to find his way back in here. So whilst we're waiting for him, um, there's been a few questions around, you know, how does the UK progress um, from where we are and, and learn from the rest of the world? Dan's just concluded that, you know, the UK is the place where actually low carbon hydrogen has got a real head start. Um, uh, you know, and, and I guess to the both of you, you know, Professor Paul Kuchanian first, Dan's just joined us, and then um, and Charles, if we could just ask that question. What, if you were looking to the UK supply chain, what would be your real focus? I'll start with Professor Paul Kuchanian. The supply chain really is... Uh if we want to make sure that we have a hydrogen economy, uh, production will become top priority. Not there to use it, uh, but production at the moment, and I'm talking about uh, carbon or clean hydrogen, has to be the top priority. Okay. So I think we, uh, I don't know if you heard the answer, it was maybe a bit quiet, but yeah. The hydrogen production is a key part of the, the generation of green hydrogen, Charles. If you were to point down the supply chain, actually one of our next speakers is uh, from Johnson Matthey, the world leading kind of capabilities in hydrogen fuel cells you know, do sit in the UK. What, what other areas would you be looking for for the UK supply chain to pick up on and, and, and focus on? Yeah, well, from an electrolyzer manufacturing um, perspective, you know, we... we um, yeah. We need a supply of labour, <laughs> and uh, you know we, we've, we've got the technology, we've got the um, the, the, the low risk scale up, and we've got the ability to deploy systems now. Um, so you know it, it's you know working with the world's largest go, um, gas company, Lindy, and it's um, Lindy Engineering. We are ready to deploy electrolyzers at scale. Um, it, I think that the shortage is going to be. A, Skills for um, um, from uh, you know, the, the education establishments. But having said that, um, you know we the renewable hydrogen industry will be natural migration from those in the oil and gas industry to join. Um, so, you know, I don't think that's an issue. That's the reskilling of the oil and gas industry potentially towards hydrogen. It, well, it's a minor reskilling, and often, often actually. Um, but it's, it's not, I think we should, should also look at across the various sectors that are going to benefit here. You know, it's you look at the amount of offshore wind that's being the, the forecast to be deployed. Um, it's enormous. Um, you, you know, you, you look at the the grid and the need for the grid to decarbonize. So we need, we need renewable electrons as well as renewable molecular energy. And molecular energy is about eight times the use of electrons at the moment. Um, so we've got to decarbonize those, those electrons as well as molecules. Um, and, you know, there's a, the opportunity to do both is, is huge. Um, and it's going to, um, yeah, bring in all sorts of opportunities for, for anyone looking to uh, future careers and I'm wishing to transgress across. And Dan, that's one thing we didn't pick up on, I suppose, in your chat with me, but uh, skills-wise, you know, you talk about the number of jobs that we're going to have to create. You know, where do you see those skills coming from at the moment for yourselves and, and, and broader, you know, as the hydrogen strategy rolls up and we get these five gigawatts by 2030? No, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a big challenge is skills, and I agree with what Charles said there, that, you, you know, you, you know the, the skills is going to be a bit of a bottleneck. Um, I mean, if you just look at the East Coast cluster, um, uh, the 25,000 jobs, and, and you know, remember, these are often quite transferable skills. It's big process type industries. Um, so, you know, everybody's going to want everybody um, if everything happens, and then Liverpool and South Wales and Scotland and Teesside, and we need all of them to be carbonized is the thing to remember. So uh, the, the reality is, uh, I think what we what we need to be doing is, firstly, we should be inspiring young people to want to get into this space. Because other than these type of forums, is it a sexy topic? 
Not really. I don't hear my children talking about it. That well, mine do actually, but that's that's <laughs> my mind. Um, uh, yeah, but um, but you know, is it a sexy topic? And, and if I reflect to Ecuador, you know, the Arimugal division, I mean, flooding through the gates in terms of going and building Dogger Bank. But what about all the end users and all these exciting jobs in this new hydrogen market? So I think we need to raise awareness. We need university programs. We need lots of really good engineers good leaders we need good industrial uh, people who can you know go and kind of do these applications welders you know the, the jobs market potential is enormous and there is an element of retraining but realistically that you know the speak and the, the deployment if you look at the 2035 targets of the six carbon budget 78 eight percent reduction we may have to have an imported workforce and position the uk alongside it so we can transition over time that's what we did, did when we built the national transmission system in the UK in the 60s. The Americans came over, built a lot of it, and then we kind of took over. So, you know, we, we, we have to spend the time really identifying where these jobs come from. And, and the last thing I'd say, just quickly, is that's obviously the jobs market. But in terms of the supply chain itself, in terms of products, I think what we need to do is understand not just production, because production for, from a hydrogen economy is just one side of it, and a lot of this is licensed, you know, kit. But what we need to know is what's his capabilities now. What what actually maybe don't we do, but we could do quite easily. And why is this stuff that maybe we don't do at all, but we could maybe consider in the longer term? And you know, if you like, we've got a tiered system, and then we're looking at exporting ammonia, clean steel. So you know, there's a there's a lot to think about it. So it's a diverse topic, but but the key thing is to get the market moving. Otherwise, we'll miss all of it. Yeah, I mean, this market moving uh, aspect, uh, you know, is it, is vitally important. If you look at globally, the large scale electrolyzer projects that there are, there are gigawatts and gigawatts being planned. There are uh, governments looking at trade in green hydrogen um, as a premium product, uh, be it by ammonia, be it or you, you, or, or, or cryogenic hydrogen, and you know the the it's going to be a competitive market place out there. And technology, we need to keep the technology being built in the UK, and it's going to be driven by where the biggest projects are. The UK's got to deploy at, at scale and have real targets for electrolyzer deployment pretty darn quick, because. You know, how long is a company like ours going to stay a UK company? There's a, there's a, we are a, there's a lot of demand for electrolysis out there. Um, I was going to say, I wonder how much of your current you know, product. You, you know, if, if you look at if you look at the um, the opportunity for manufacturing for developing the, the supply chains, um, this is a quite a short window we've we've got to really make a um, make a uh, a step forwards in, in deployment. Uh, otherwise, um, it'll go elsewhere. Look at wind. Look at solar. We, we developed these technologies in the UK, and then they went abroad. Um, we've got a massive opportunity to not only to have manufacturing jobs, but to actually decarbonize our industry with renewable energy um, without the any um, issue and, and liability of other external forces and, and uh, market prices. And we've got an inexhaustible supply of wind and an inexhaustible supply of water in certain areas. And, uh, you know, we, we can make an inexhaustible supply of fuel and, and address all our insecurity if, if we're clever. So, Professor? Yes, um, I think it's another challenge that we should look at is the oil and gas industry is a multi-trillion sort of industry, well established. You know, you to get a... Uh, oil, crude oil, convert it and bring it to one part of the world to another part for that price. It clearly indicates a very established supply chain. At the same time, it has a very well-established customer base, uh, is essential, and you have that uh, tech, uh, in energy industry that has to start moving to provide some of these renewable energy. They are very conservative, well, not very, but relatively conservative uh, uh, energy sector, and they have to adapt to the new technology and new supply chain, which will be a challenge. 
I think it's a it's a challenge that I think we're all looking forward to it, and it seems like you know and it, you know the education, the re-education, the reskilling, the upskilling of workforces. It just doesn't come at a better time. I think we've got this perfect storm. Charles, you were saying, you know, the demand's got to pick up. We've got to have some consistency to policy. It's coming. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we need the demand then to be fulfilled and the supply chain. And Dan's talked about that. It's coming. And, and we've got the skills here. So actually, there's a, there's a collaboration between all of you here in this panel to sort of think, how do we keep? And I think you make a really good point, Dan. I, I looked at the audience uh, list and, you know, maybe 50% of it is people with their emerging careers wanting to join into the hydrogen economy. And that, to me, is more heartening than seeing lots of people who are advocates for hydrogen on this call. So I think that there is a growing interest. We need to keep that message out there. I see this period between now and COP26 as a, a bit of a, a springboard. We need to keep the agenda high in terms of what the ambitions are. And to Charles's point, you make the point, we need some metrics. We need some quality decision making between now and COP26 and make those commitments real um, and then be measured on them. I guess that's your point, Charles, is it? Yeah, it is. And I think, you know, if you look at um, the, the, the mixed message, blue and green, and Dan, you know, you, you, you commented that blue was, is a stepping stone for green. Um, I think you've got to be, you know, there's a lot of misconception here and, you know, comparing apples and oranges. And, you know, if, what are you comparing and what basis, um, what, what parity of parameters are you looking at? Because if you're looking at the, um, the, the purity, the pressure, the greenhouse glass footprint, um, you know, how are you comparing it? Um, the other aspect is the assumptions based on uh, co-location. So the prices will vary depending on whether you're um, producing at a point of use or whether you're transporting the gases. And there are assumptions on um, the, the greenhouse gas footprint and the um, global warming potential. There are assumptions on leakage. There are assumptions on a whole range of different parameters that dictate the price and the availability of that hydrogen. And so to say one is, will enable another is, is actually on what basis you don't have a um, – without a um, – a clear comparison based on the known parameters of that parity, you, you, you're, um, you can't do it. Uh, I, I would argue that actually that you, electrolysis is ready right now to start ramping up, where you're going to have to wait some time for very large capital intensive projects to get going. Um, and that's the risk that your, your um, blue hydrogen has. I'm all, for, I'm all for hydrogen use in, in the industry, but I do feel that there should be a, an understanding as to do what the opportunity is with the green hydrogen side. Um, so I just wanted to put the, the record straight a little bit from my point of view based on the opportunity you had to answer that question earlier. Yeah, I mean, just to come back on that, Charles, I'm not surprised an electrolyzer manufacturer would say that. But, um, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, which is a fair point, I think. Um, the point is scale. You know, forget everything else. It's gigawatt and gigawatt and gigawatt. If you put a gigawatt, of, and we're looking at blue green hydrogen projects, if you put a gigawatt of green hydrogen in the UK at the moment, it would be producing very dirty hydrogen because it's not connected to a gigawatt of wind, which would actually need to be two gigawatts of wind because the net capacity factors and storage and supply and demand. So there's a reality. We're looking at these projects everywhere, and the big challenge is understanding supply and demand and Often what happens at the moment is it does turn into a bit of a dog and pony show with we've got a gigawatt and well I've got 1.2 gigawatts and well I've got 1.8 gigawatts and, and it's like yeah, but it, that's not the point. The point is how do we manage supply and demand? How do we build a market? How do we justify infrastructure? How do we maintain super low carbon hydrogen such as the standards recommended? And the reality is you need, you, you need both. So I don't think anybody disagrees or certainly I don't disagree in the the end game of transitioning to an entirely green no, I'm, 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 the reality is the scale at the moment needs needs guaranteed low carbon bigger gigawatt that can justify the the infrastructure and the more green the better it's not a problem for me at all that. Okay. well that's a, a really interesting point i don't want to end it there <laughs> but it is a, a couple of questions i'm going to take that one to do it yeah yeah hi um Dan, charles um you know Obviously, at the moment, we're experiencing this, this crazy uh, 
spike in uh, gas prices and electricity prices. And part of that is because of the, uh, the very low uh, offshore wind output at the moment, you know, 75 below, 75% below the, the, the normal output levels. So I was wondering if I could hear from either of you or both of you about what you think the role potentially of, of nuclear is in terms of providing baseload co-generation, the so-called pink hydrogen. Is it a, a, a valid future contributor or is it uh, just you know, uh, a bit of uh, opportunism by the nuclear industry? <laughs> so, um, well, I don't, I don't go Dan first. So, well, me first, uh, okay. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the first thing I'd say is, you know, the UK still uses 2,000 terawatt hours of energy a year. You know, and we've got a target by 2035 to reduce emissions by 78%. So this isn't, you know, it's, it's almost too easy to say, but it really isn't a one or the other. It's an all. You, you know, to get them targets, you really, really have to go hard if, if it's going to be possible by 2035. So nuclear, you know, it can have a base. You can obviously make a bit of hydrogen off the off the back of it if you want to. But I think um, the, the the costs are prohibitive. Um, you know, everyone can see the cost. The time scales are prohibitive. Obviously, it's not very flexible. So, like you see, you know, it maybe provides a, a base load, but then there's issues with the waste side of it. So, you know, and I'm not an, an expert in the nuclear industry at all, but but I think there's when you look at the scale of the challenge, there's a place certainly in the in the decades to come for. I think having a pragmatic view to say, is it low carbon, and can it can it actually meet our carbon reduction targets and get us to net zero? And and let's not perfection. Uh, and, and my view is, let's not let perfection be the enemy of the good here, um, because that won't help anyone. And 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 I think collectively as people, as much as we might have slightly different angles. Um, I'd like to think most people agree that actually solving the climate change challenge target is something that we can all unite now. Thank you. And, um, and Charles, does, does nuclear-powered electrolysis uh, fit in your vision of the future? Absolutely. I mean, we, 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 we produce electrolyzers that can ramp up from 20 to 100 percent back down again in two seconds. I mean, they're, they're, they're designed for grid balancing frequency control. It's, the question is how you accommodate all this low carbon electricity on the grid, um, however it's produced, wherever it's produced, um, and um, you know we can convert those electrons to hydrogen there efficiently um, anywhere, and uh, you know you can feed it into the gas grid and use it to store the hydrogen in the gas grid. Um, you can feed it into salt cabins and have enormous stores of renewable and nuclear energy in salt cabins. Um, you know to to back up the system um, in the event of wind going down um, as well as um, you know, gas prices going up. You know, there, there's all sorts of um, ways to play it. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, we've just got to decarbonize very, very quickly and we've got to throw hammers and tongs at it and just get it done. Um, and uh, yeah. So with that, Charles, you, you, you've really underlined the, uh, the purpose of being here, which is, Everyone, I think, Dan, you're right. We're all aligned with trying to hit these goals for the climate neutrality sooner in terms of carbon. Um, you know, what we're doing here with the Translational Energy Research Centre's team is helping us move faster. You're both huge advocates of, of what we need to showcase to the world. And so thank you very much for joining us on this panel. I'm sure there'll be tons more questions and I, I expect they'll be flowing in through our little break now. But I want to say big thank you to you both because I know you spent a lot of your afternoon uh, either on standby or joining us for this and it's been a really exhilarating com conversation and, and thank you Professor for allowing us to have it here. So with that um, we've got a 15 minute break for those that can join us we're coming back to more hydrogen um, uh, actually here in, in the facility we've got Sam French from Johnson Mathy, we've got uh, Carmini for me from Baker Hughes Waygate Technologies and we've got a, an innovative startup fuel cell company called High Point that's looking to ground itself in the UK. So some great things to look forward to this afternoon amongst a number of others. So, again, thank you. Sorry you couldn't be here. Um, I'm sure you'll be both visiting very soon and, uh, and look forward to that. Thank you again. Cheers. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Everyone thank you. Yourself online will meet you back uh, after the break at quarter to four. Thank you. Right. Thank <laughs> you.